Welcome to the latest edition of Access All Areas Backstage Podcast. Today, I'm with Matthew Phillips, the director of Notting Hill Carnival. We're at the Tabernacle in the centre of Notting Hill, um, and it, it represents really the HQ, the hub of uh, all the activity building up to um, the event each year. Um, Matthew, what does this building kind of mean to you, really, in terms of um, you know the involvement and it being the kind of heart of the event? It's really a hub of the community outside of Carnival. It's a it's a central meeting point for the community to come together, and it played an early a role in early carnivals. You know from costumes being developed here, um, steel bands rehearsing here. It's, you know, it's really been at the centre of Carnival for, you know, over 40 years. So you've been kind of coming here for a long... I know you were involved in... Um, your dad was involved in um, the Mass Band. Yeah. Um, so my dad started Mangrove Mass Band. He co-founded it with Frank Critchlow in 1978. And then in 1980, um, they followed up by starting Mangrove Steel Band. Um I think I've got a picture of myself stood just over there as a as a in a sailor costume at Carnival 1982. <laughs> I think it was. Um, so I've got very early memories of this building being, you know, literally the, at the centre of the community, but also at the centre of Carnival. Yeah, and very much an integral part of your kind of life and development, I guess, yeah. in many ways. So how old were you back then in that sailor? Uh, t- about ten. Yeah, right. yeah, <laughs> ten years old. Um, so my my first experiences of carnival were watching the steel band rehearsing. Um, before Mangrove rehearsed, they used to be on All Saints Road, um, just across the road from the old Mangrove restaurant. And yeah, my first memories was watching the steel band develop. And then a couple of years later, I played. Um, before I started to play the steel band myself in 1984, for a couple of years, I I wore costume at carnival. One year was a sailor theme, and the next year was a I think it was an army theme. And I mean, obviously, mass is short for masquerade, isn't masquerade, it? So, masquerade. for the sort of unfamiliar, what what's a masquerade or mass band? Well, a mass band is, you know, carnival is a, is a, a celebration of of freedom, and it's a chance for people to express themselves. So, you know, traditionally in the early carnivals, you know that you know carnival came out about after the the, the emancipation of slavery in the eighteen hundreds, and early carnivals were, you know, former enslaved people dressing up and kind of mocking their, you know, their former slave masters. And, you know, they would, they would dress up and put on pointy long noses and, you know, some of them would dress up as devils, which often gets misunderstood. Um, people wearing a devil costume, they're not actually devil worshipping. What they were doing was pointing a mirror at their former oppressors and saying, look, you're, you're the devil and look what you've done to us for 400 years. Mm. So, I mean, obviously you've seen the event evolve over the years as you've been involved in it can you kind of talk us through the sort of timeline of kind of um you know your when you first got involved um in terms of the actual running of it i mean now you're um, obviously the director but i mean initially what was your first role kind well, of i've been involved in um running mangrove mass band and the steel band since 1993 i think was the first year that i started managing the steel band um and it's kind of evolved since then. The opportunity came up um, at the end of, t- after Carnival 2017, um, to get involved in the organisation of it. And um, it, it felt like a, a natural fit, you know, um, and, and be, to be able to tie in things like the Tabernacle um, to have as a central base and office space for the Carnival made sense. Um, by that time, I'd been running the Tabernacle for... I think six years, um, so it felt like a bit of a, a natural evolution. Um, and I mean, obviously, you took it over at a period where you know you had no idea then we were going to head into the mad world of COVID. Yeah, <laughs> um, so it was quite a quite an, uh, an unusual time to, or, or a challenging time to, I guess, to take it over. Um, what? Obviously, it kind of, you know, annihilated, annihilated, annihilated the entire kind of events industry. You know, everything was kind of shut down, obviously, as everyone knows. Um, what was the kind of lasting impact of COVID? Because I remember talking to you near around that sort of time and you did a lot of digital activity and, uh, 
the interesting aspect of that was you got a huge international audience that was streaming content that you were putting out there. Yeah, so you seven kind of got and a half really... million people viewed our Access All Areas content over that wow. weekend. Um, for us, it was a great, you know, um, from a from a kind of a community perspective, but also from an organizer perspective, it gave us all a chance to kind of pause, reflect on what had happened and take it in and then, you know, actually start thinking about the future. Um, you know, Carnival is a, is a juggernaut. It's a, it's a big event and we're kind of rolling. It's nonstop. Um, COVID afforded us, you know, a couple of years of just being able to breathe and we actually were able to put in place things that we, we had in mind, but we just didn't have the time because we were just focusing on the event planning and, and getting things, getting things done. Mm. Um, we learned a lot of lessons, particularly around, you know, the digital side and filming content, which we've carried through to the live event coming back. Um, we try and capture as much as we can, um, to, to, to put out on our own YouTube channel, but also, you know, to hold in archive, you know, um, for future use. And so that kind of streaming data, if you like, or, you know, being able to see the hot spots, if you like, around the world of where you were kind of getting a lot of traction in terms of the streaming. What were, what were the kind of most interesting aspects of that? I mean, were you finding that certain countries? Well, it was, really- it, it really was global, to be yeah. honest. Um, you know, it was all over the world, you know, all over, you know, South America, North America, Africa, you know, all over Europe, we, you know, we, the analytics that we were able to gather, um, from YouTube gave us an insight into where, where people had an interest in carnival. And it was, I mean, I, I knew it was global, but I wasn't really up until that point. I wasn't, uh, you know, really aware of the extent of the interest globally in, in carnival. Yeah. Yeah. And it's what, something like 2 million people attended. Yeah, that's, that's, Does that make it the biggest carnival in the world? In, um, um, well, Brazil, it's second to Brazil. Um, yeah. We fortunately have developed a partnership um, with um, via the British Council and the Brazilian government. So this year we actually went to Salvador Carnival, took part in their carnival, and it gave me an opportunity to see kind of how they do things. Um, and next year we'll be going back and touching all of their cities, hopefully. So Rio, Sao Paulo, um, Salvador, um, Recife, um, because Carnival is huge, you know, in, in Brazil and all of the cities kind of, you know, they all take part in it. It's very much in their DNA, just like for a lot of people in, in London. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to say, I mean, obviously you've been part of this community, you've been part of the event for so many years. How important is it really to the local community that this event takes place? And It's as important and sometimes more important to some people than Christmas. You know, it's something that they, they, they really look forward to. Um, the carnival bands and sound systems are all kind of communities within themselves and they, they do activities throughout the year. But, you know, for two days of the year, we all come together and create what I think is a, a very special event that celebrates inclusion, diversity and bringing people together. And when it comes to the amount of people that are involved, I mean, I know on the, when it actually takes place, there's a huge number of people that are involved. But when it comes to kind of the amount of people that are in that building throughout the year working on, on the team with you, um, can you just sort of talk us through how that works in terms of like the key kind of roles and also kind of, you know, how that builds as the event draws closer? It's, 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 it's a very small team compared to what the event is. And also the team is also working on other things, not just carnival. Um, the carnival does rely, you know, on like a lot of festivals, to be honest, it's not just carnival, you know, festivals up and down the UK really rely on the, on the goodwill of volunteers and supporters. Um, because if you're actually to quantify and put a cost to, you know, not just carnival, you know, there's hundreds of other festivals in the UK that, you know, none of those would be possible without the kind of support and goodwill of people, you know, just like Carnival, a lot of the festivals that have you know, gone commercial now, they all started out in the early days as free parties. People wanting to celebrate and come together. You know, that's been commercialised and there's an argument whether that's a good thing or not. Um, but yeah, to put it simply, there's a, there's a core team that are working throughout the year of about five or six of us, um, which expands. And then we've also got, you know, companies that we work with that take on certain roles. And then it just massively expands, you know, basically from now until the end of August. Yeah, yeah, and and obviously you, um, 
when it comes to the actual event itself, you know, you've got a huge number of people working on it. Obviously, you're working with tons of agencies and everything else. But in terms of the stewards, I think something like sort of 15, 20% of the stewards are actually from the local community. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Roughly that. We've got, and we've been growing the stewards. Um, when we took over in 2018, I think the first year we had 650 stewards. Um, at last year's carnival, I think it was closer to about 1,700 stewards. Um, so we're trying to change the ratio of stewards to um, police so that the police can focus on their yeah. core responsibilities. Um, yeah. And how important is it really to have people that are volunteering from the community working for an event that they've probably known for years and they know the area? And I mean, it must be really... It's very important, especially from the, from the stewarding perspective, to have um, stewards recruited from within the community that are able to offer information and correct information. Um, is is vital to the to the success of the event. Yeah. yeah. And so um, when it kind of comes to the actual event itself, I mean, you've got obviously the police and the council and, um, you know, other emergency services. I mean, can you sort of run us through <laughs> the number of kind of different agencies and, and departments and everything um, that you have to kind of work with, coordinate? There must be, there must be so pretty big meetings. Our, our, event, um, our event control room will have representatives of, from us. Um, we'll have the fire brigade. NHS, London Ambulance Service, St. John's Ambulance, um, the, the, the three stewarding elements. So we use Mackenzie Arnold that do the bulk of our stewarding, but we also use another, another security company called Patriot who do stages and they, um, look after an element of, of the route as well for us. And then we have, um, about 200 recruited, you know, locally from the community and they some of probably 80 percent of them have been with us for the past five years yeah um some of them do other work throughout the year so a couple of years ago we stopped using the external security company for the tabernacle so all the events that we do throughout the year are the security is provided by sia of um sia sia operatives that have gained their qualifications through working with us at carnival I was going to say, I mean, obviously, you know, having it, 2 million people coming to an event is just a mind-bogglingly huge amount of people. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, is, is security kind of must be one of the bigger points of focus, I suppose, um, when it comes to an event of that scale. Has that sort of evolved over the years in terms of the way that you liaise with police and all the other different areas? Um yeah, I mean, it's constantly evolving because our environment changes. So there, there's things that are happening at a time that we might have to react to. Um, so it's a, it's a really a constant evolution of how we steward and manage crowds. Um, thinking changes, um, in terms of how to manage crowds and flows of crowds. Um, something we introduced last year to the, to the, to the ELT, which is the event control room. Um, is a crowd monitoring cell. So we, there's a team that are just literally looking at f receiving feedback from on the ground, but also looking at cameras um, and making sure we can keep people safe. Um, yeah. Cause that's, you know, ultimately we want to have a safe and spectacular event. Um, and, you know, a lot of that is down to how we manage crowd flows and stuff like that. You know, sometimes people complain about, oh, this road is closed off. Um, you know, where we do have barriers and the access isn't permitted, it's for it's for the reason. So we've got a a, a pressure relief because if all the roads were just open and you've got it, you know, it gets overcrowded, there's nothing you can do about it. By And there are very few, um, but by having these strategically placed um, roads that we control, where crowds get too big, we have a way of relieving that pressure um, to, to keep people safe. And when you were... I think I know the answer to this, but when you were standing over there and you were sort of, you know, dressed as a sailor and you were 10 years old, did you have any inclination at all that you, did you have any dream even of kind of like, you know, wanting to be involved or even manage? manage no, not at all. Um, if, if I'm completely honest with you, um, I, like many people, viewed this role as a, almost like a poison chalice, you know, because you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Um, <laughs> But I, you know, I've I've got a love for carnival, and I wanted to see it succeeding. Um, and I think there was a there was there was a gap that was that was there that needed to be addressed. Um, and I think we and I think we've done pretty well. You know, arrests for the most part have gone down in the last few years. Um, you know, and yeah, I think I I didn't really <laughs> it wasn't on my on my bucket list or something that I wanted <laughs> to do. It's kind of just happened. Yeah. 
And um, I mean, it's an obvious question, but I can't resist asking it. I mean, what would what what's the kind of first highlight, I suppose, of your uh, your lifetime, really, being involved in carnival that kind of springs to mind? Um, just, and that's not an easy question. To ask. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I think those those early days, you know, carnival was a lot was a lot smaller then, um, and just yeah, just playing and being involved in it. I remember being able to be. The steel band floats used to, they didn't used to be on lorries. They just used to be, you know, homemade things, you know, often that you could steer. And I'm, you know, for age 10 or 11, I was able to steer. And I've, I've got really fond memories of steering the float through carnival. Yeah. Being barked at orders, obviously by the adults. Um, but I think that's where I learned a lot of my uh, uh, driving skills and, and awareness <laughs> of people around because I was driving a, a, a steel band float with thousands of people around me. Yeah. Um, all I had was a brake in the steering wheel. There's no acceleration. You're relying on people pushing it, which is how the floats used to be. Um, so those are, you know, that's probably my fond memory. Playing, playing mass as a child, playing steel band and, you know, being a participant and, in, and enjoying the event. I still enjoy the event now, but it, my, my enjoyment comes from different things. That comes from, you know, I'm not really at the party, but just when I do get out to be able to see people enjoying themselves and 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 the, the diversity that's at carnival is you know it's it's a rare sight yeah i mean there isn't anything like it in this country is there really i mean on, on on the same scale at all i mean you you mentioned there about your childhood kind of experiences i mean how much of a focus is there continually now you know on making sure that it's accessible to younger people and families well one of the things we've been focused on is really supporting you know sunday as children's day um and you know that's that's key to the to the future of carnival. You know all of the children's bands. They're the next they're the next generation that will be taking over carnival. You know and making sure that they can enjoy carnival, enjoy their culture, and you know and and feel safe and connect with it is a is a key driver for us as an organisation. Okay, and obviously one of your other roles uh, these days is. Um you know, your chair at the Association of Independent Festivals for the last couple of years. I think it was 2002 yeah. you started. So, um, you know, in part of my role, I've had, you know, been writing up the sort of bad news about lots of uh, festivals have been kind of closing this year. I think it's gone past sort of 50 now, which is a kind of impact, uh, the, I guess, an extended impact from COVID, but also obviously what's happened with, you know, costs for production going through the roof and staffing going through the roof. Yeah. Um, which has made it very difficult. And there's obviously all the calls that you've been uh, party to, you know, for government to reduce VAT on ticket yeah. sales and everything else. When it comes to Carnival, has it been sort of subject to those kind of pressures at all that the, those, you know, the events that have had to close have been, um, have been impacted by it? Absolutely. I think everyone's, everything's become more expensive for everybody. And, you know, our, you know, the majority of our costs are on stewarding and security um, to a lesser extent infrastructure that we put in. But where that's just skyrocketed, rocketed, it's, it's kind of hurting everyone. Um, you know, we're lucky that we, we have support from some key strategic partners and, like I say, the goodwill of many people, and that includes individuals and companies. And when it comes to, I mean, obviously it's a, it's a free event. So uh, when there's two million people coming, it's a mas massively important event to so many people. How does it kind of work in terms of the funding and and uh, getting it you know getting it all, all together? I know the GLA are a major yeah, support. The, the, the GLA, uh, Westminster Council, and RBKC are key funders. But then we also you know we have a lot of commercial partners that support. Um, we have individuals that support, and that's key to the success of Carnival. And and I I think it's only right you know Carnival generates. There was a, an in-depth study done, which is now 20 years out of date, but it can only have gone up. And at that point, it was £94 million pounds was wow. generated for the UK economy. Wow. Um, so for me, that justifies the funding and support that we get from the GLA and the local authorities because of what it does for London's economy at the end of August, which, you know, at the end of the summer holidays, it's, you know, it's a bit of a, it, you know, it must be a bit of a quiet time for a lot of businesses. Um and then we get this massive injection that comes in and, you know, the government reaps a reward from that because everything's got VAT on it. <laughs> and you're obviously running Carnival Trust, isn't it? Is it Carnival, Carnival Village Trust. Village Trust. So we're a, na a national portfolio organisation for the Arts Council. Um, 
been going since 2008 it was established and our focus is to help develop and support carnival arts um, so it ties in nicely with the ultimate expression and display of carnival arts in this country anyway is the Notting Hall Carnival. And so when it comes to, I mean, you were talking earlier on about the costumes and all the kind of, um, you know, self-expression and everything else that goes into carnival. Um, when it comes to kind of just before carnival, is, is do, do you find that this building is kind of uh, taken over by people building costumes and that kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. We have, we have a mangrove mask band and steel band are based here. Um, mm. So we have, you know, Costumes are being made, you know, as we speak, but it really, it will really ramp up in the next couple of weeks. Um, and people are able to come and get involved in making costumes. And we do this year, we'll actually be working out of four other bases locally as well to get more young people involved. Um, and we're working up with other local centers. Um, the steel band rehearses here for six weeks and that's open to the public to come along and hear the steel band rehearse. Um, similarly, at our other building, there's four or five different costume bands based there, and then we've got Ebony Steel Band are based there as well. Um, so both buildings become, a, you know, a hive of activity, really buzzing around in the excitement building up to the event. And how important is it that the event is? I mean, there's obviously a lot of talk as well. I know festivals and have been struggling, um, but there's been lots of talk about you know, the high end ticket prices and the way that that's changed. And for for many in the communities or around the UK, really, um, they're out of their reach. Um, so how important would you say that having an event like Carnival on the scale that Carnival is, and having that event being free, how important that is? Oh, it's very important because it removes all barriers. You know, it's, it's open to everyone. You know, you don't have to have budget for a massive ticket price. Um, you know, but having said that, you know, I'm not going to speak about concerts, but specifically festivals. Um, and there's a couple that have quite a high ticket price, but they're, I think it's undeniable the value for money that you get. Mm. If you spend three or four hundred pounds on a ticket and you go to one of the big festivals, you know, the value for money is that you can't even, there's so much on offer. You can't run out of things to do or people to see. Um, you know, and the experience, you, you know, you, you can't put a price on it. I, you know, I, I, although it's, on, you know, a cost of living crisis and people are struggling, um, you know, I think it's amazing that these events are able to do it based on that ticket price. You know, people often think, oh, people are walking away with millions. That, that really isn't the case. Mm -hmm. you know? let's, let's take Glastonbury, for instance, which is the biggest event in the country, mm -hmm. biggest festival, mm -hmm. um, a paid festival, but you know, the employment that that creates with people is, mm. you know, and I know many local people around the festival benefit from the festival, but, you know, thousands and thousands of people, get, you know, are gainfully employed for yeah. six months. Yeah. You know, not just, it's not just about the four or five days of the festival. They're working and they're able to work in a field that they want to work in. You know, these are creative people and there aren't many outlets where people can can work, you know. And like I say, they get paid, but they're not paid, you know, extortionate amounts of money because they have a love for the for the festival. Yeah. You know, we've just come back, Notting Hill Carnival did a collaboration and this, this was our third year. We've just come back for it. So it's very fresh in my mind, the amount of goodwill. And it, it, there are similarities with, with Carnival and, and, and an event like Glastonbury because they can only come about because of the goodwill of the communities that are around them. Yeah, yeah. And I mean... Talking about that impact that events have in terms of, you know, not only giving people work and everything else, but um, you've obviously kind of grown up with this event. Are you aware of lots of other people that have kind of grown up and have you seen other people's kind of people benefit in the terms of, you know, growing their skill base through coming, working with the trust or? Absolutely. If you look at the, 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 the bands and sound systems that you've got, I, I always say it, they are communities within themselves. And often if you look at them, you'll see there's, there's young people coming up within them. I can think of at least 10 masquerade bands that are that are products of coming out of either their parents band or another band you know there's there's a meeting happening just over there of one of our costume bands and that's the second generation of of bands you know it's it's been taken over by you know and that will continue you know these bands will sometimes bands change and i suppose it's similar to festivals there's a natural organic way that you know things change and you know 
you know, one band might not come out this year, but it will create a new band. And sometimes it's set the same people involved in that band and there's been some slight changes. Um, so it's very much, you know, it's something that's passed down through the communities. Yeah. Um, but we've also got an open door and open to new people and new, you know, new ideas coming in. Um, so, you know, band people are able to apply to have a mass band or a steel band. It's not, it's not anywhere a closed shot. Um, but a lot of those bands that have been there for years, like for instance, I'm an example of that. My dad started the band. We, we co-founded it with Frank Critchlow in 78 and then the steel band in 80. Um, and I took over and then there'll be someone else that takes over Mangrove and, you know, and, and that's the same for the other 80 odd mass bands. We've got 36 sound systems, you know. Wow. So your outfits for, for, um, the, the mass band that changes the mangrove band that changes every year every year there'll be a different theme yeah. um what are you going for this year um this year it's it's based it's it's based around water and and you know a bit of an, a nod to the wind rush generation but also acknowledging that we were here before the wind rush so in terms of this this um event coming up um obviously your band you know you change the costumes every year uh what, what are we what are we what can we expect this year um uh, with Mangrove, this year it's very much about the sea um, and the water. So there'll be sailors, um, there'll be references to the corals in the ocean, there'll be a reference to Windrush, um, and we'll be, we'll be trying to make note of the fact that actually you know, there were black people in the UK way before the Windrush um, and have been contributing, you know, whether it's through the, 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 the Air Force or others, for years before that. Um, not taking away anything from the Windrush generation because, you know, that's what, that's what Carnival, you know, it was built on immigrants, not just from the Caribbean, from all over Europe. You know, Ronnie Laslett, who was the kind of catalyst that started the September fair that turned into to, to Carnival. She was um, part Native American, part Russian. So, you know, it's, it's all kinds of immigration. I'm myself, I'm a, a product of immigration. My mum came from Ireland and my dad came from Trinidad. Um, funnily enough, one of the, the, the things that we've just done with Glastonbury, with our collaboration, you know, we were in an area called Terminal One, which was talking about immigration, which is very topical at the moment yeah. with government policies, etc. Yeah. Um, and it was a very clever sign above where our DJs were playing. So it was an original immigration sign but some additional words were put above it, which was powered by immigration. And I thought that was really powerful because the music that's being played and Carnival was powered and came about from, from immigration. And I, I know Chris McMeekin obviously um, runs the Shangri-La area down in, um, as part of Continental Drift down in Glastonbury. Yeah. And uh, he's been involved in uh, kind of organising a new scheme to kind of get people from all sorts of backgrounds um, with disadvantaged backgrounds, particularly involved in the festival industry. Do you, are you encouraged by, uh, an increase in diversity among the, the, among the people that are working in the festival industry? I mean, obviously the needs, there's more work needs to be done. Clearly having worked in it and looked around, there's more work that needs to be done. But do you feel like everyone's moving and pushing in the right direction? Or? Oh, definitely. I think, I think that program that Chris is doing is amazing. I actually spoke to the young people a month ago. They came here and I spoke to them about Carnival. I saw some of them at Glastonbury this, uh, last week. They were working on it and we're going to have quite a few of them working on Carnival with us. Um, yeah, re really kind of, um, it's exciting to see, you know, who and what's coming coming through and to get involved in it. And, you know, it's a shame that they didn't know or have the avenues before, but I'm really glad that something's being done about it. Um, yeah. When it comes to you being able to share your own expertise, I guess that's the kind of, you know, opportunity you have as your role here and the kind of hub of creativity and being able to kind of pass on the knowledge and pass on the experience to, to your team. Yeah. I mean, do you tend to kind of bring on people from the local community? I imagine that's kind um, of a key focus. Yeah, very much so. And, and my, the way I do things is that I'm very open. You know, anyone can ask me anything. If it's, even if it's not involved in their particular role, mm. if they've got a question, um, I'm not very good at, you know, giving it, but if you ask me, I will give you the information. Um, I think, I think it's important that, you know, whatever people are doing within our organization, if they've got a curiosity and they want to know about other aspects of it, it's important for them to have that for context. Um, 
So I think, you know, I'm really happy to open this year, anything with, with any member of staff. Um, and to some, to some extent, you know, the general public, you know, somebody asks a question, I'll tell them. And what's the most challenging aspect of your role? Um, I just think time, there's never enough time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet, yeah. Yeah. Um, just managing everything in the... Yeah, just, I suppose, managing the, the, all of the, all of the different components, um, you know, because we, we, in addition to Carnival, we, like you mentioned earlier, we, we run Carnival Village Trust to develop Carnival Arts, um, but also two venues and that in themselves, one venue is enough to, to, to manage, difficult enough to manage. And we, we have two to contend with, um, one being a grade two listed building, which comes with its own complications. And yeah. then we've also got the Yard Centre just over in Westminster. So we're now just weeks away, really, from from the event. So uh, I imagine that you're you're getting tired and tired. Yeah. And <laughs> time's getting shorter and shorter. But what is, what sort of excites you most about the uh, the next one? Um, I'm really looking forward to to seeing you know the creativity of the costume designers and what they come up with this year. There's some I've seen some really exciting things in terms of. Um, what they're doing in costumes because all of the bands have launched their costumes and, and are promoting them so there's an opportunity for people to get involved in the bands and there's some really interesting designers coming up and coming um, and there's also going to be some 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 new changes to the main stage which are going to be I'm excited to see how, how that turns out. Can you tell us what those changes are yet? Um, well it's, there's going to be a return to a former, uh, we've got a former partner returning, but there's also an addition, which we're just finalising, literally this week we're finalising the details on that and we'll be able to let people know us in, in due course. Brilliant. We're well, looking forward to seeing it. Well, thank you very much for taking the time, Effie. Thank you. It's too. great to meet you. Cheers. No